troubleshooting wireless LAN installations. Now in this video we'll learn about the common causes of problems that may occur on a wireless LAN such as problems due to multipath, hidden node, near far, RF interference, all band interference, throughput, and yes even weather may cause problems with wireless LANs. Now I'm not going to leave you out there high, high and dry. Yes we'll learn about why these components cause problems or may cause problems but we'll also learn about the solutions to these problems as well. So get your troubleshooting toolkit together because we're going to solve some problems with wireless LANs. First starting with multipath. So first off, what is multipath? We learned a little bit about this in the uh, RF fundamentals video in this exam pack. So let's use this illustration as a refresher as to what multipath is and the problems associated with multipath. Now on the left hand side I have the antenna for the transmitter. On the right hand side I have the antenna for the receiver and this line going in between the two is the line of sight path between these two uh, antennas. Now within their path, within the radio frequency path, their Fresnel zone, we have two objects. We have a riverbed and we have a building. Now what happens is when the transmitter is transmitting the radio frequency signal with these objects in the path, this main signal is reflected off of these objects. It's reflected off the water. It's reflected off, say, for example, the windows on this building here. And the result is the transmitted signal arrives at this receiver here from various directions over multiple paths. And hence the word multipath. Also, because we have these multiple radio frequency waves coming from different directions, not all of those waves will uh, come together at the receiver at the same time. And the delay between the instant the main signal arrives and the instant that the last reflected signal arrives is called the delay spread. And as you can probably imagine, having the radio signal splintered off into these multiple paths is not the best for optimal uh, transmission. So let's bring up another whiteboard and learn about the effects of multipath. Now just a moment ago we learned that the difference in time when the main radio frequency wave reaches the uh, receiver and the reflected radio frequency waves reaches the receiver is called the delay spread. Well this delay spread also causes another problem. When the reflected radio frequency wave is out of phase or unsynchronized with the main uh, radio frequency wave and as a result the waves don't arrive at the receiver at the same time this causes a decrease in the signal amplitude and this is also known as the downfade or the downfade is a decrease in the signal amplitude as a result of the radio frequency waves arriving at the uh, receiver at different times. Also if there's an extreme amount of multipath meaning that there's many reflected uh, radio frequency signals off the main signal that can cause a corruption of the radio frequency waves or it can actually nullify the reflected wave and the main wave altogether. With nullification what can actually happen is that a reflected wave can actually gain an amplitude over the actual main radio frequency wave. And this gain in amplitude can actually cancel or nullify the entire set of uh, reflected radio frequency waves including the main wave itself as a result nullifying uh, the entire transmission. So that's what multipath is and the effects of multipath, but what can we actually do about multipath? Well, let's bring up another whiteboard and learn about the solutions for multipath. Now, some of the solutions here are pretty straightforward. If you have the objects within the path of the radio frequency wave that are causing that radio frequency wave to be reflected, see if you can either remove those objects from that path, and if you're not able to do that because it's a building and that building needs to stay there, or you're, you can't channel and change the direction of a river or a lake, well, in that instance, see if you can actually move the uh, transmitting and the receiving antennas to be out of the path of these objects that are causing the radio frequency waves to be reflected. So if you're trying to reduce the effects of multipath with outdoor wireless transmissions, typically the best solution is to move those antennas. However, inside is a whole different arena. Inside you typically won't have to do anything. So for example, on a typical wireless access point, it has two antennas. And these two antennas are uh, specifically there for a technology called antenna diversity which is used to compensate for the effects of multipath. And let's bring up another whiteboard and learn how antenna diversity can compensate for the effects of multipath. 
So in this illustration, we have the line of sight path for the main radio frequency signal, and then we have uh, some multipath here. We've got a radio frequency signal being reflected off maybe a window, and another one being reflected off maybe a filing cabinet. So we've got some good old multipath happening here. Well, with our wireless access point with two antennas, with antenna diversity technology, what this will do is that it's always kind of sampling these signals that are coming at it. And what it does with the sampling is that it will sample on both antennas to determine which signal is the highest quality, has the highest strength. And then the receiving radio will then choose and accept the higher quality signal over the lower quality signal. Also, let's say, for example, this wireless access point needs to uh, transmit a radio frequency signal back to the wireless station. Well, in order to send a signal back to the wireless station, what it'll do is it'll send the signal over the antenna that it had received the highest quality signal strength on. So let's say, for example, it had received and through antenna diversity received the highest quality signal over the right antenna. So when it comes time to transmit a radio frequency signal back to the wireless station, it'll send that signal over the right antenna as well. So again, the two antennas are there for to combat the effects of multipath. It doesn't mean that we've got two radios and we're doubling the fun. Now, having said that, though, each antenna can be used to transmit or receive, but not at the same time. So I can't transmit over both uh, antennas simultaneously, nor can we receive over both antennas uh, simultaneously. Only one antenna can be used at, a, at any given time. So I can use one antenna to transmit, then the other antenna to receive, but not simultaneously. Now, another problem you might encounter on a wireless LAN is called hidden node. Let's bring up a whiteboard and learn about this. So in this example, we have a single wireless access point that's sitting on top of a wall. Maybe it's a brick wall with steel or reinforcement. And as a result, the two wireless stations that we have here on either side of the brick wall aren't able to hear each other. They're not able to hear each other's wireless transmissions. So they can both send and receive uh, wireless transmissions to the access point, but they're completely clueless as to the presence of each other. Now, if you remember in our previous video, wireless LANs use the CSMA CA protocol in order to avoid collisions from occurring on a wireless LAN. And most wireless LANs use the DCF mode in, uh, in an effort to determine when the coast is clear, when they have the green light to transmit frames on the wireless LAN. Well, in order for those processes to work to avoid collisions, the wireless stations need to know that each other exists on the wireless LAN. Remember that the radios in the stations were always sensing the medium, are always taking samples of the medium to see who's there, who's trying to transmit, in order to go through the steps involved in DC, uh, DCF mode to determine whether or not they can transmit. Well, there lies in the problem. If station A and station B don't know that each other exists, they're going to assume that they've got the uh, green light, that the coast is clear and that they can transmit. So because they don't see anybody else transmitting on the wireless medium, station A sends a transmission to the wireless access point, and good old station B sends that transmission to the wireless access point at the same time. And guess what happens? Because they're both transmitting at the same time, this access point is going to receive those transmissions simultaneously, and as a result, we've got a collision of those frames that it receives simultaneously. Now, if that were the end of it, it may not be so bad, but if you remember from the previous video, if we have a collision, the station is not going to get an acknowledgement frame back from the access point saying, hey, I got the frame, everything's cool, send the next frame. Well, because the stations have not received an act frame back, guess what they're going to do? That's right, retransmit the frame that they did not receive an acknowledgement for. And that's going to keep going on and on and on. We're going to get retransmission, retransmission, retransmission because the frames are going to collide, collide, collide. So as you can imagine, that's going to add a lot of overhead to the wireless media. And as a result, throughput can de decrease as much as 40% on top of the overhead that's involved by using a CSMA CA protocol. So now your throughput is down to almost zero. So for example, if some users call you up stating that their wireless connection is just dog slow and it takes forever for anything in the network to appear on their computer, what might have happened in that instance is that 
A user may have moved their wireless station, meaning their laptop with a wireless network adapter, to another part of the building. And now that it's been moved to this other part of the building, it is hidden from the other stations. And we get these problems that we just described because it's now hidden. So what are we going to do to resolve this hidden node issue? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's bring up another whiteboard and see what the solutions to this are. Now, one workaround to this problem is to enable the request to send, clear to send protocol on the wireless access point. We learned about this in the previous video, but if you remember what happens when uh, this protocol is enabled is that the station that wants to send a frame to another station will send an RTS frame. And remember, these frames all go through the wireless access point. So even if the stations themselves are hidden from each other, with RTS CTS enabled, because this is going through the access point and the stations themselves can gain access to the access point, these, these frames, RTS and CTS, go through the access point and as a result will get through to its intended recipient. So we've got this uh, station, station A, that is hidden from station B. It wants to send some data to station B. We enable RTS CTS. And what will happen is that the wireless access point will forward this RTS, this request to send frame to station B. And station B will get that frame and then send back a clear to send frame. Well, in the process of sending the RTS and CDS frame, that also informs any uh, stations that are nearby that data is about to be sent between station A and station B and for those other stations to delay the transmissions and as a result avoid any collisions. So if you notice after enabling uh, RTS CTS if throughput increases that is almost always indicative of a hidden node problem. So even though uh, the process of sending these RTS CTS frames adds a little more overhead it actually is less overhead than letting all these stations sending frames that are colliding with each other and retransmitting uh, colliding frames as well. So again, if you notice that after enabling RTS CTS throughput increases, that almost always indicates that you have a hidden node and really the permanent solution would be to go and find that hidden node and to move it back to a location where it's no longer hidden. So by using RTS-CTS, it's not really a solution per se to a hidden node problem. It's not going to unhide a hidden node, but it will help to increase throughput as a result of having a hidden node due to the RTS-CTS process. So a better solution is to have a hidden node unhidden, to have it reveal itself to the other wireless stations. And this can be done by increasing the power of the uh, wireless network adapter. Let me show you the typical location where uh, that configuration is made. Let's go, our, go to our network connections folder. Let's go to the properties of our wireless network connection by right clicking on it. Choose properties. Now let's go to the properties of our wireless network adapter by clicking on the configure button. Then from here we go to the advanced tab. And on most wireless network adapters you'll find a property that's named transmit power or output power. You want to ensure that the value for the transmit or output power is set to 100% versus a lower percentage here. So if we got the lowest, our radio frequency signal is not going to travel as far as if it was configured for 100%. So watch out for that setting. Another option is simply to use a high gain antenna to have that radio frequency signal travel further, travel greater distances, and hopefully uh, in so doing, unhide that node. Or we can simply remove the obstacles that are in the path of the radio frequencies or even better yet, see if we can just simply move that wireless station to a location where it's no longer hidden. So the moral of the story is that we want to be very careful in where we place our wireless stations to avoid the hidden node problem and another problem called near-far. Let's bring up another whiteboard and learn about this problem called near-far. So in this illustration we have wireless station A and B which are about 15 feet away from the wireless access point. In contrast, wireless station C is way out in the boondocks here. It's about 110 feet away from the wireless access point. Now another very important point to consider here is that the transmit power of wireless station C is set to a low transmit power, maybe about uh, 10 or 12 percent. In contrast, the transmit power of wireless station A and B are set to 100 percent or high power. So a couple of things are coming into play here. Because the wireless station C is transmitting with low power to begin with, 
the further away that it is, the weaker its signal will get. So what's happening here is that we create this effect where these wireless stations with uh, high transmit power and that are closer to the wireless access point have a louder voice. And their voice essentially is drowning out the voice of wireless station C. So the transmit power or the signal strength of these wireless stations that are closer to the wireless access point essentially drown out the signal strength of the wireless station that is further away and that is transmitting with low power. So another way to look at this is that pretend station A and station B are a collection of a, a whole bunch of people. You've just got a group of people that are just shouting at the top of their lungs and just making this high, high, high volume of noise. And then 110 feet away, we've got this single person who is also shouting, but the shouting of this person way out at the edge of the crowd here can't be heard by these people because of the volume of noise that they are creating. So with our wireless stations, the low-powered station that is further away simply cannot be heard over the signals of the wireless stations that are, have high powered and are closer to the wireless access point. So remember that if the wireless stations can hear each other, then the shared medium access rules of CSMA CA will come into a play and allow each of the stations to transmit frames in turn based on the CMA CA access rules. So the problem, though, is that this poor little station out here, out yonder, is just not being heard. It's being drowned out, and as a result, it can't transmit its frames. So how do we resolve this problem? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's bring up a whiteboard and look at the solutions to this near-far problem. So the first step to resolve this problem is dealing with the transmission power issue. The first step would be to increase the transmission power of the wireless station that is further away from the access point, or what I refer to here as the remote station. And then the second step would be to decrease the transmission power of the uh, stations that are closer to the access point, or the local stations. So by doing that, you've got this one-two punch that essentially levels the playing field. So on the one hand, we're saying, hey, you way out there in the boondocks, we're going to increase your transmission power so you can be heard over this din, this noise of uh, the local stations. And to ensure that you can be heard, we're going to decrease the power of the local stations since they're closer to the wireless access point and they're not going to need as much transmission power to begin with. Now, another solution would simply be to move the remote wireless station closer to the wireless access point if that's possible. So for example, if the remote wireless station is in an office, either as a laptop or a desktop, and that's where the person works day in and day out, it's probably not going to be that feasible to move that person from one office to another. It may or may not be, but that is an option. Another option is simply to move the wireless access point closer to the remote station, but you have to be very careful as to how far you're removing uh, the access point, because if you move it really close to the remote station, you can recreate the near-far near far problem again. Uh, so for example, if we move the wireless access point very close to station C, using my previous example, now the wireless access point is further away from station A and B, so we might have just recreated the problem again, but with different stations. So. Typically, it's easier to move the stations than it is to uh, move the wireless access point. Now, another common problem that may occur on a wireless LAN is a reduction of throughput due to radio frequency interference, which can be caused by other wireless access points or other radio transmitting devices such as cordless phones, microwaves, so on and so forth. Now, let's bring up another whiteboard and talk about interference caused by other wireless access points. Now, first off, we need to review some of the concepts that we learned in the spread spectrum technology video in this exam pack. Now, a typical wireless access point can accommodate quite comfortably uh, 25 wireless stations that have been associated to it simultaneously. Beyond that, performance starts to degrade. It's kind of an economy of scale. The more we add on to it, performance starts to degrade. So 25 is not a lot. 25 users associated to one wireless access point is not a lot for a large company that needs to provide uh, wireless coverage to a lot of users. So what companies will typically do is place multiple access points in the same physical location to provide wireless coverage to all those users. And placing a multiple wireless access points in the same physical location is referred to as 
co-locate or a co-location of access points. And the wireless clients, the wireless stations will then, if all else remains equal, will associate to the wireless access point that has the uh, highest or the best signal strength, which effectively provides some load balancing between these co-located uh, wireless access points. Now, the problem with co-locating 802.11b and 802.11g uh, compliant devices is that they communicate over the same uh, ISM band at the frequency of 2.4 gigahertz range over 1 through 11 usable channels in the United States. Now, if you remember that each of these channels are 22 megahertz wide and that some of the channels can actually overlap with each other, and that's where the problem ensues. So, for example, the frequency range for channel 1 is 2.401 to 2.423, and the frequency range for channel 2 is 2.406 to 2.428. So, because channel 1 extends all the way out to 2.423, that'll overlap with the next channel quite a bit. And that overlapping of these two frequencies causes radio frequency interference between these two access points. And the radio frequency interference can cause system throughput to uh, decrease due to collisions that are happening due to the radio frequency interference. So in this example where we have two wireless access points that are both configured to channel 1, and the coverage area of both of these wireless access points intermingle with each other, they overlap with each other, there's going to be a lot of radio frequency interference between these two uh, wireless access points. So the solution to this problem is to configure all the wireless access points with a channel that does not overlap with each other. So the three non-overlapping channels for 802.11b and 802.11g compliant devices are channel 1, channel 6, and anybody remember the third channel? That's right, channel 11. So in this situation where we have these two access points both operating on channel 1, we have what is referred to as co-channel interference and this creates the greatest amount of interference where both access points are sharing the same channel or rather operating on the same channel as opposed to adjacent channel interference. Adjacent channel interference would be this access point operating on channel 1 and this access point operating on channel 2. Those two channels are adjacent to each other which certainly create a fair amount of interference but not nearly as much as co-channel interference. So we can resolve this situation by having one of these access points operating on one of these non-overlapping channels. So for example, we can configure this uh, access point to operate on channel number 11, and theoretically no RF interference should happen due to uh, these non-overlapping channel configurations. Now I say theoretically because there is the slight possibility that channels 1 and 6 could have a very slight overlap with each other and there is also the possibility that channels 6 and 11 could have a slight overlap with each other. And this would be caused by the access points transmitting at a high power and are located very close to each other. And this is due to the fact that uh, radios don't have an exact edge to their spreads beyond the edge of their actual channel boundaries. So that uh, end of that channel boundary, for example, the ending range for channel 1 is 2.423. Well, that's not a hard and fast, firm wall. There is still, uh, depending on the power output of the wireless access point, there's still some radio frequencies just eking out beyond that a tiny bit there. So what can we do to remedy this situation? Well, number one, you could reduce the power output on the access points, which in turn would uh, reduce their coverage area, the cell area, which would in turn eliminate that small amount of uh, coverage area, that overlapping area between these uh, channels. Or you can achieve the same effect by physically uh, moving the access points further away from each other so the access points uh, coverage area do not overlap with each other. Or you can simply go back to using two access points. So if you use two access points, configure one to operate on channel 1 and the other one to operate on channel 11. And that will ensure that no matter how close these access points get to each other, there will not be any overlapping at all because the distance, the spread between those frequencies is so great, you'll ensure that there won't be any overlapping at all. Also, when you go back to using two access points, the aggregate uh, throughput is just about the same as using three access points. So, for example, if you were to use two access points, which give you a throughput of 5.5 megabits per second, you get an aggregate total of 11 megabits per second. 
Now, if you were to use three access points with a little bit of overlap where each ac access point is giving you fi uh, four megabits each, well, the aggregate throughput there is 12 megabits per second. So there's only a difference of one megabit per second. So there's not a, an extreme loss of throughput by using uh, just two access points. But if your main consideration was increasing the amount of stations that have access to the wireless LANs, then try using the other two solutions of reducing the power on the access points or moving the access points a little further away to ensure that there isn't any overlapping at all between uh, these channels 1, 6, and 11. And another option is simply to use a mixture of 802.11a equipment with 802.11b and g equipment. The advantage of using uh, a equipment is that it, they provide eight non-overlapping channels for indoor use. And there's a lot of wireless network adapters that you can purchase now that support tri-mode, meaning that it can operate either in B, G, or uh, A mode. Now, another type of configuration of using multiple access points that you should be aware of is a, a configuration that provides for seamless roaming. Let's bring up another whiteboard and take a look at this. In this situation, we have six access points. And so if a user were to take their laptop and walk down this gauntlet, if you will, of radio frequencies, because each of these cells overlap here, each of the coverage areas overlap. So I'm not talking about channel overlapping. I'm talking about coverage area overlapping. The user will always maintain their wireless uh, connectivity, which is what the goal is here. So the best practice for creating such a coverage area is through a method called channel reuse. So if you notice here, we are using the three non-overlapping channels, channels 1, 6, and 11 here. But notice how they're positioned here. So we have the coverage area of channel 1 here. That's represented by this circle. Next to channel 6. But notice that we don't have any co-locations of channels. I don't have a channel 1 next to a channel 1. I don't have a channel 6 next to a channel 6. I don't have a channel 11 next to a channel 11. So here's channel 1 right here. And here's channel 1 all the way over here. So we're reusing the same non-overlapping channels. So this configuration creates the best environment for seamless roaming while providing the least amount of channel interference as possible and providing very good throughput. And I don't want to scare you into thinking that channels 1 and 6 might overlap with each other and channels 6 and 11 might overlap with each other. I just wanted to let you know that uh, the difference between theory and practice don't always meet. Theoretically, they should never overlap, but because the radio frequency sometimes blend out past that channel boundary once in a while due to high level output and due to very close proximity, there is the possibility for a little bit of overlap. However, in most instances, you won't have overlap by using these three channels. Uh, typically, if you space the access points far enough away from each other where you still have uh, the coverage area overlapping, but due to the fact that we've got multipath, that uh, there's path loss, that the radio frequency is absorbed by walls, that uh, typically what's going to happen is that by the time the radio frequency reaches the other access points, uh, adjacent channel interference is all but eliminated. So certainly other access points can cause radio frequency interference with our uh, wireless LAN. But there are other types of devices that might cause radio frequency interference as well. And ideally, before we deploy a wireless LAN, we should try to discover any potential sources of radio frequency interference. So let's bring up another whiteboard and learn about other types of uh, interference. So other wireless devices can cause two types of interference, either narrowband interference or all-band interference. And typically, narrowband interference really doesn't interfere that much with a wireless LAN, as it doesn't create interference across the entire band. So for example, a device that causes narrowband interference would not cause interference across the entire frequency range used by 802.11b, g, or uh, a devices. It would just cause the interference for just a tiny little schmidgen uh, portion of it. Say, for example, just one megahertz of uh, interference. And if a device is causing narrowband interference, typically it will just affect a portion of a channel. And if the wireless access point is configured to automatically choose the best channel for receiving and resending the radio transmissions, what it will do is it will automatically choose a channel that is not being interfered with with this narrowband interference. So for example, if uh, a device is causing narrowband interference on channel 4, 
the wireless access point might choose to operate on channel 11. However, the type of interference that we do need to be concerned about is all band interference. And all band interference means that the RF signal can cause interference across the entire band, meaning that the signal can interfere with the radio frequency band from one end of the radio spectrum to the other. And unfortunately, of the two types of interference, all band interference is the more common one because a lot of devices can cause all band interference. Uh, devices such as wireless or portable phones, microwave ovens, Bluetooth devices, all these type of devices can cause all band interference. Now, in case you're not familiar with Bluetooth, Bluetooth is a wireless technology that allows for short range wireless uh, connectivity. Bluetooth uses FHSS technology and operates on the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band. And it's typically used by portable devices such as cell phones or PDAs for uh, wireless synchronization. So, for example, you can use uh, a PDA with a Bluetooth enabled PDA to establish a wireless sync between the data on the desktop and the data on uh, the personal digital assistant. So because these devices are pretty common, you can be pretty sure that you'll encounter some type of all band interference on your wireless LAN at some point or another. And really the solution to eliminating all band interference or narrow band interference is first finding the devices causing interference to begin with. And an inaccurate way to find these devices is just simply to walk around the environment looking for portable phones, microwaves, uh, other electronic devices that might emit all band interference. However, the exact method to find these devices is to use what is referred to as a spectrum analyzer. And you can use either software-based or hardware-based uh, uh, spectrum analyzers to zero in on and find the source of the narrow band and all band interference. So to get an idea of what I'm talking about, let me bring up a picture of a typical handheld spectrum analyzer. And so here we go. You just simply walk around with this, turn it on, obviously. You walk around with this, set it up, tune it into the band that you want to uh, do this analysis on. And as you're walking closer to the radio frequency signal, the radio frequency signal on the display of your spectrum analyzer will increase in amplitude. So when the R signal peaks, and you see this peak in the screen there, you should be standing right in front of that offending device. Now, these puppies are pretty expensive. They're usually around the $4,000 range. So if you don't have $4,000 kicking around, another alternative is to use software-based uh, spectrum analyzer. Let me bring up a picture of an example of that. So here we see a software-based spectrum analyzer, which is a component of some software for uh, the Proxima wireless network adapters. So this particular spectrum analyzer is proprietary to uh, Proxima wireless network adapters, but it's included uh, free with the uh, Proxima wireless network adapter. And this example actually displays the uh, RF frequency for a cordless phone that operates in the 2.4 gigahertz range. And we see here on the right-hand side that the frequency is in the range of uh, a wireless access point that would be operating on channel 11 here. And some cordless phones use uh, DSSS technology or FHSS technology. And if they're using DSSS technology, they might automatically change the channels in which they operate on to reduce the amount of interference that is, that is being uh, encountered by the actual phone. And sometimes you'll find a little button on the phone to change channels manually to uh, reduce interference that you get on the phone caused by other wireless devices, such as your wireless access point. So as you see here from this graph, a cordless phone could definitely cause some interference with your wireless access point, though. So again, in order to eliminate narrowband and all-band interference with your wireless LAN, you're going to have to use a spectrum analyzer to, number one, find the uh, offending device, and number two, remove that offending device if at all possible. So if it's a cordless phone, can you place it somewhere else out of the frequency range of your wireless LAN? If it's a microwave oven, can you move it somewhere else out of the frequency range of your uh, wireless LAN? Now, if for some reason you're not able to remove these uh, devices that cause this all-band interference or the narrow-band interference, what you're really left with is possibly changing from 802.11b or G. Uh, devices to 802.11a devices, which, if you remember, operate on the 5 gigahertz uniband. 
However, as you probably noticed, uh, cordless phones that operate on the 5 gigahertz uniband are becoming more and more popular as well. So the ideal situation is to remove or move the offending devices further away, far enough away from your wireless LAN so they don't cause uh, interference with your wireless LAN. Now, something else I wanted to mention, though, is that it's not that uncommon for an employee to install their own uh, wireless access point at the company's network for whatever reason. However, that is a security risk. So there's a couple of methods that we can use to find these wireless access points, which, number one, are a security risk, and number two, can cause radio frequency interference with our existing uh, wireless LAN. The first tool that we can use is called NetStumbler. This is a free program that will just identify that uh, there are uh, access points on the wireless network that are in our radio frequency uh, coverage area here. So here I am, and I see that there are access points operating on three channels, channels 1, 6, and 7. And out of these access points operating on these channels, we have 3, 6, 7. Out of these seven access points, only one belongs to me. The rest of these access points are access points of uh, my neighbors. So our first step is simply to use NetStumbler to identify the presence of any unauthorized or what's referred to as rogue uh, wireless access points. Now, once we've identified these, uh, that there are rogue access points, we would then use our spectrum analyzer to actually find the location of it, either, again, by using a handheld spectrum analyzer or by using a laptop computer configured with a wireless adapter using software-based spectrum analyzer. And again, NetStumbler is a free program, and it can be downloaded from stumbler.net. Now, let's go back to our whiteboard and learn about the last type of uh, situation that can cause performance on our wireless LAN to be degraded, and that is good old bad weather. Now, in general terms, weather isn't going to have a major impact on the performance of your outdoor wireless LAN connections. However, extreme cases of weather, such as torrential uh, downpours of rain, hurricane, tornadoes, etc., will definitely have a, a performance impact on your wireless LAN. For example, with rain, and your typical average rainy day, it's not going to affect the transmission, your wireless transmission and reception. However, the rain that accumulates on the antennas can definitely have an effect. Uh, for example, if you have a Yagi antenna that is exposed, the antenna elements are exposed to the weather. If the raindrops accumulate on the antenna elements, that can make the elements actually look longer as far as uh, the wireless LAN reception is concerned. And the results of making that antenna look longer can affect the transmission and the reception. Also, the rain on nearby objects, such as uh, raindrops accumulating on leaves and trees that are in the transmission path, can have an attenuation effect of the wireless connection. However, if there's a torrential downpour of rain within the transmission path of your outdoor wireless LAN uh, signal, that will have an attenuation of the radio frequency. Not a whole heck of a lot, but it will decrease the radio frequency signal strength between point A and point B, between the two antennas. Now, typically that amount of rain to affect the radio frequency signal typically only occurs during hurricanes and just very, very, very strong downpours of rain. And hopefully people won't be working during those times. You don't want people working during a hurricane. Also, we can protect the Yagi antenna elements from bad weather elements by using what is called a ray dome. Let me bring up a picture of what that looks like. So on the left-hand side, we see Yagi antenna with its exposed elements. And then on the right-hand side, we see this uh, tube, this cylindrical tube, which would cover the elements. And this cylindrical tube is called a ray dome. And that tube would just allow the rain to just roll off of it so it doesn't accumulate on it. And this also helps to prevent uh, ice from accumulating on the antennas as well. So let's go back to our whiteboard here. Now, wind by itself is not going to affect the radio waves or attenuate the radio frequency signal. However, if the wind is strong enough, it can move the position of the antennas back and forth or left to right in such a way that can degrade the signal between the two antennas. So if you need to mount your outdoor antennas in an area that is subject to strong winds on a regular or seasonal basis, it's best to use what is called a grid antenna. Let me bring up a picture of what a grid antenna looks like, which we see right down here at the bottom. 
So you can see here with the grid antenna, it does not have a solid reflector dish. It allows the air to pass through it, unlike the parabolic dish that we have at the top here. So by allowing the air to pass through the antenna, it's less subject to having the antenna move left to right or backward and forward, which is extremely important for highly directional antennas. They have a very focused, very tight beam width. And if the antenna were moved just a few degrees to the left or right or backward and forward, that could knock out the wireless signal completely or severely degrade the wireless signal. And lastly, fog or smog can also contribute to a degradation of uh, your outdoor wireless LAN performance. What happens with fog or smog is that it eventually settles down into layers of fog, then air, fog, then air, or smog and air, smog and air. And this layering of either the fog and air or smog and air is called stratification. And what happens is as the RF signal passes through the fog and as a result these layers of fog or air, we actually get some refraction, which is the bending of the radio wave in such a way that it changes direction, which is obviously not a good thing. So there really isn't too much that you can do about the effects of fog or smog on the uh, radio frequency transmission, except for to wait it out and to be aware of this possibility. And with that, that brings us to the end. Let's bring up our whiteboard and do a recap of what we've learned in this video. So we kick things off by learning about the causes and effects of multipath. And the best way to avoid multipath is simply to ensure that the obstacles in the transmission path that would cause multipath have been removed. And we could also consider moving the antennas so that there's no um, obstacles within the transmission path, again, that might cause multipath. However, we also learned that access points typically use antenna diversity to compensate for multipath. And we also learned that if uh, we're experiencing a very high collision rate on our wireless LAN, that could be due to the fact that a wireless station is a hidden node. If we encounter a hidden node on our wireless LAN, we could very well have two wireless stations transmitting simultaneously. And as a result, we can have collisions happening, which is not good. So to resolve this problem, we can either increase the power, uh, use a high gain antenna, remove obstacles that cause the station to be hidden to begin with, or move the station out of the obstacle path. Or we could even consider using R RTS, CTS. And we also learned that a near-far situation can be created if we place a wireless station far enough away from the access point and is transmitting with low power that it's not heard by the access point because it's being drowned out by uh, wireless stations that are closer to the access point and transmitting with higher power. And the solutions to the near-far problem are to increase the power of the remote station and decrease the power of the local stations or simply move the remote station closer to the wireless access point. And we also learned that co-locating access points and other wireless devices can cause radio frequency interference, which in turn can degrade system throughput. So when co-locating wireless access points, remember to use the three non-overlapping channels of 1, 6, and 11. And remember not to place those uh, access points that are using those three channels too close together so channels 6 and 11 or channels 1 and 6 don't overlap. And we finished off by learning how rain, wind, and fog and smog can affect the performance of our wireless LAN. And with that, that brings us to the end. I hope that this video has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.